Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri. Today we're going to talk about the coronavirus a little bit. We're going to mainly talk about my frustrations with the, we'll call it the analytics community, the data science community, the statistics community. Um, a little bit about my frustration with that, as well as talking about the data and the modeling and the purposes on a little bit more of a stat side but let's just dive on in. Okay, so just to start off here with my frustrations in general, as I'm scrolling through LinkedIn, there's chart after chart after chart of nonsensical stuff on the coronavirus. There are dashboards, there are maps, there are bar charts, there's everything, okay? There's all these charts and that's fine. But I'm gonna show you guys an example here just because I think this is one of the best put together examples. So it's not that this is bad or anything, this is actually a pretty awesome dashboard and everything. Uh, it's on the coronavirus for Italy. But I just want to point out some of the issues here on why I'm tired of seeing charts and why if you're out there, you should not be making charts and posting charts. Um, but anyways, let's just look at this real quick. So here's the summary tab. Again, really awesome graphics. It looks amazing. But again, it's showing here like in one chart, like here are the intensive care numbers. Here are the like hospitalized with symptoms all this stuff, there's, you know, recovery, death, active, and these charts are awesome because as you move the mouse, you can see the numbers. And then, of course, these are the different countries here, which is fine, and there's a bunch of stats here on the left. And then you see this chart here, and it says positive cases, and it has a line fit to it. And then you go to here, and it shows, again, all these numbers. And then here's a lot of the data they're using and whatnot. Um, and again, there's a about page, which is awesome. They have, you know, information sources and all that. That's great. So it's really cool, right? From a data perspective, it's awesome. It's fun to play with. It's cool to look at. But here's the question. So what? So you look at this data. So what? What is it doing for you? Right? This isn't actually doing anything productive. And I think this is where my grind and my frustration here continues to come as I see more and more charts and plots and many of them far worse than this. Like this is great quality but there's more and more charts and plots. And if you Google through a lot of this, you can see that like there's more of these charts. So again, that one is well done because they're all in one frame and everything. But this has like a map and it has like lines. So look at all these numbers and it has bar charts and like, it's great. But here's the question, what is this doing? Right, you're just reporting numbers. Okay, so we go back to here and you say, um, okay, on uh, March 26th, let's see here. So March 26th, we had 10,000 essentially recoveries. Uh, there's 8,165 deaths and there's 62,000 active cases here uh, overall. Okay, that's great. So for Italy. So what? What are you doing? What value are you adding? You're not. You're not adding any value. You're actually causing panic in the markets a lot of times because so many people are creating so many charts and people start thinking these are like models and predictions. And so for example, this chart on the bottom left, People see the dots, again, non-model people and lots of the modeling people that I've seen in the comments typing dumb comments. Um, there's all these dots and they're like, oh, look at this great model. And based on this, we're going to see recovery within, you know, uh, a month or 36 days or some ridiculous assumption. You know nothing about the data. You know nothing about the virus. You're not a medical expert. You're not a biostatistician. I'm not either, which is why I'm not creating charts and I'm not pandering and telling everybody, hey, look at me, look at my charts, right? And again, if you look, this is where, again, it's coming down to a lot of the frustration here with the data science community specifically is you're just fitting lines to data. You're not predicting anything. You're not creating any actual meaningful projections, at least not in most of the cases I've seen. And if you are, again, are you a medical expert? No. Are you a biostatistician? Probably not. You're not qualified to be doing this. So again, fitting a line, um, I'll fit a line even better than this. I'll just use a Taylor series approximation. Uh, we can fit it and connect the dots. Problem solved, right? Uh, you could do all kinds of smoothers, so like kernel density estimation, and you can use like low S, for example, and you can smooth things and create simple models to smooth it and connect it and make some chart. But the problem we're having is, which leads me to the big thing here is, what's the goal of creating a model and what's the goal of providing these? Is it just for entertainment? Because that's clearly what I'm getting from these. Like, it's an entertainment thing, which then I feel like is kind of, not rightly done like it's this is a serious matter here so now you're like making charts for the sake of making charts and i'm all for like learning and practicing your skills and seeing what other people are doing 
But again, you probably shouldn't be sharing a lot of this and then people in the comments talking about what they do and don't know as if you're an expert because you're not. Um, but let's just talk about this now from a modeling standpoint. Um, so first off, let's look at the data. As I mentioned with the data, it's all just actual data on what has already happened. So this would be like a development data set or you can split it and create a development data set and out of time data set if you're actually gonna model this. But again, all this, this data we have here, so like intensive care, total hospitalizations, recovery, death, this isn't meaningful. This isn't causing, death doesn't cause the coronavirus, okay? We need to look at things that are deeper. So if you're gonna model this, these are things to consider, okay? And I'm not encouraging you to go model this, but I just wanna talk about how you model things and implications and stuff. Um, so one here is total population. So it's really irresponsible to say like, this country is doing such a better job than this country because the numbers are so much larger. Well, what's the total population here? Are we dealing with like China, which is billions of people? Or are we dealing with, I don't know, some small dinky country in Europe that's like, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000 people. At mo like, you know what I mean? That's way too small for a country. But in general, like how big is the country? What's the total population? Um, percentages are far more important when you look at, at populations than actual numbers. So again here, like the US versus Italy versus Spain versus UK versus China versus India, what's what's like what's the base number? You should be taking like the total number of deaths and dividing it by the total population or the total infected, for example, and trying to figure out percentages which are far more meaningful than a number. Um, now that being said, before I even get going even further, data quality and how data is collected and understanding the data is extremely important. And I'm seeing a lot of people just ignoring this completely. Um, one, data is not being collected correctly or consistently. So for example, in the US, we had coronavirus far sooner than we thought, as with every other country for the most part. Um, it's when somebody gets infected and they transmit it to tons of people. And then finally we start testing a few here and there. So for example, Washington State was one of the first to get tested and they started doing more tests and more tests. So their numbers are booming. And yet you look at other states like New York and like Texas, for example, Colorado, they had like no cases for a long time. And then magically all of a sudden they had like one or two and then it exploded. And you see these charts that are just like spiking. It's not that the cases are spiking. It's that we're not testing. So you have to realize there's a limitation on how many we can test, how many kits we have, how fast we can test, how many labs can process them. These are all things you need to think about when you're modeling this because it's gonna be far more complicated than just fitting a line to some dots on a sheet of paper or doing some sort of trend, okay? Now, the second part's gonna be data quality here. So I know a lot of my subscribers are gonna be upset about this, but China, when they started posting numbers back like in January, my first question to one of my Chinese colleagues was, do you trust the data? And they responded with, yes, I trust the data. However, I think they are releasing it slower to make sure that they have, I guess, good accuracy on the tests and they're being a little bit cautious on how they're releasing it. When the cases came out and I saw that they were like in the 60, 70, 80,000 range, that seemed far too small to be a virus, especially like a crazy one that it seemed like something was off there, especially when you have so many people in China crammed so close together. I didn't buy it at the beginning. Uh, I'm still not buying it. China is not being honest with their data. Again, this is not really a surprise to me, which is why I questioned it at the beginning. So when you're modeling it, be careful when you use data like China, you might exclude them because it's not accurate data, okay? And that leads me to looking at other types of variables. For example, population density. How densely populated are cities and countries? Um, that could be a meaningful variable in the model on how fast these spread. Um, Types of transportation, for example, family size, what's the average family size, how many people live together in the same building or community, how many are apartments, how many are housing, for example. All data that I believe is somewhere out there you might be able to get your hands on. Uh, and if you're actually modeling this for productive reasons, you probably work for a government agency and you would have access to this sort of data. Um, policies are gonna be huge here. So what is the impact of the policy? Which countries, which states, which cities are implementing specific policies? Are schools being closed? Uh, is there shelter in place? Is it a full, complete shutdown where everyone's like locked into your city or your building? Um, are citizens being monitored? So I know South Korea has been a, I guess, kind of like the idol of like a good example of what should be done. 
But again, I've read a lot of stuff talking about how they use monitoring and like cameras and visuals to track people and test people that seem sick or to track where that person's been that was sick and then try to test all these people around them. Um, that's fine for many countries, but that violates many, many uh, standards and ethics and morals within the United States. Uh, freedom comes first in the US. So again, how much freedom are you willing to trade for safety? That's a question to ask, but there are legal issues in the United States why you can't track people. So again, looking at these policies though, looking if other countries implement these, how do they impact them? Um, the number of hospitals, number of beds, number of medical staff is all going to impact how fast it's spreading in specific countries, states, and areas. Um, again, if you can treat more people, more people recover faster, then there will be less issues of spread. If, for example, your country doesn't have a lot of these supplies and there's shortages, which there seems to be everywhere, uh, then what ends up happening is that some countries can't contain it or can't, you know, try to keep people quarantined that should be quarantined. And again, number of supplies is baked into their masks, ventilators, other things like that that are going to support this system and this process. Supplies will help prevent people from getting sick, especially those that are administering, you know, like nurses and doctors that are administering like health support kind of aid and whatnot. And then finally here, population characteristics are huge. We're seeing this play out in the United States specifically. Um, obesity, diabetes, heart conditions, other underlying conditions in general. Um, the south of the U.S. is, be, is known to be uh, overweight, diabetes, heart conditions. Um, they're not the healthiest people compared to other parts of the country. Um, some of these southern states are seeing higher death rates because of this. Now, again, these are all variables that could be predictors and predicting different things that we'd want to know. So now it leads us to the question, what is the goal? What I mentioned at the beginning of the video, what is the point of modeling things? The point of modeling is to come up with the answer to some question, some questions that I thought off the top of my head, things that could be modeled, things that could be predicted, things that we need to know that impact people and countries and governments. And I'm sure governments are looking at this and have people working on this. So don't worry, right? There's people working on stuff like this. But questions would be like, how many will die from this, right? This could be a time series problem. So you could use a time series model to predict this. Again, using some of the variables we talked about earlier. What are the effects of different policies? So again, looking at other countries that might be further ahead in the curve um, or countries that have, I don't know, have had good success. Looking at their policies, how do you implement their policies? Um, how many lives will we save from that? Can we end it sooner? That leads us to when will it end, right? So are we modeling this to see when is it going to end? I've seen a lot of charts and data here. For example, like these curves, like how do we flatten the curve? How do we extend it? So the time frame might be longer, but we might have more medical supplies. So again, how do we answer these questions using variables and data, not just facts of whatever have happened so far? How do we ensure medical supplies and treatment? How do we predict food distribution? So again, we're talking about distributing like medical supplies, but is this going to have a negative impact on food? So I've seen people that are like hoarding, you know, toilet paper and food, like canned goods, for example. Uh, how do we predict that? How do we ensure that stays stable? Again, this would be another problem from the virus that could be modeled with actual data. But again, a lot of these food distribution companies would have their own data and then looking at external factors as well, right? Regions, populations, density, all that trying to figure out how the demand's shifting, uh, who's more infected, right? If some area is more infected than another one, they might have more hoarding, they might have less hoarding, I don't know. You gotta look at all that, it's all in the data here. And just to wrap this up here quickly, right? You could model this in a variety of ways I've mentioned here, but again, looking at actual data that's not predictive, like there's no relationship that we're trying to look at, we're trying to figure out what's causing the spread, what's causing you know, shortages in medical supplies, what's causing all these different effects. So all these questions we talked about, like an end date, for example, we need to figure out what are the causes and effects and then trying to figure out if those are gonna be stable. So again, stationarity and time series modeling, if you're modeling this as a time series, is crucial because we need to find variables that are going to be predictable across time. So they might have a trend, they might have a slope, they might be easier to predict. And then we can plug these into the model to predict things that we really just don't know and try to impact them. And again, utilizing global data and global scale here. So trying to find quality data on different countries at different points in the cycle, looking at policies and all these effects will impact the results to these answers. So that's just kind of my wrap up here, guys. It's a little frustrating just to see so many charts and things going around, especially when they're not providing much insight or data or information. 
And then you have data quality issues, which nobody seems to be thinking about. Like, I'm just shocked and that people haven't stated this sooner. Or maybe it's political. They didn't want to state it, but they've already, like, considered it. Um, and then, again, looking at external variables here, right? You're not going to learn much about, you know, where we are going in the future by looking at the current data or the past data. You need to have some driver variables and relationships and make connections between those so that you can build statistical models to predict that. So... Anyways, that's my take here on the coronavirus modeling, my frustration with all these charts people are generating. Again, you're probably just generating a lot of panic and misleading people in general, which is confusing, upsetting, especially for those that are not data-driven. They're not going to be asking the questions. They're just going to see these charts. So, for example, like this bottom left chart, you're going to see it and you're going to be like, wow, like it's coming to an end. We see the slope coming over. People might not even stop to think that this is Italy. People might not stop to think that this is just a fitted line. There's no actual prediction on this. So again, they've been discussions on like a rebound. Is it going to rebound? Um, also here, when you start looking like at total numbers, this seems like the number of cases is declining, but yet we still see a continual increase uh, in active cases, deaths, and recovery. So presenting just one chart versus multiple charts, again, a lot of people are misleading other people. It's not the best idea to create charts for the sake of it. If you want to create a chart and you want to share it, that's awesome. But I would put like a disclaimer and say, hey, like I'm practicing my skills on modeling or building dashboards or charts or whatever. Uh, what do you guys think? What would you add? What would you take away? But I wouldn't start discussions on talking about like the virus and how smart you are and trying to predict things, which I've seen some people do. Um, again, none of the charts I've presented are trying to do that. They're just providing data. But again, what is that really doing for you? Especially when big companies like, uh, I don't know, New York, the New York Times, for example, and other websites are already providing the stats and the data. The government should be providing the data, right? If you want legitimate data, go to the government and like the CDC and the World Health Organization as they are actual like facilities that are recording this and have quality assurance in place. Um, but anyways, that's me just rambling here on coronavirus and data and modeling and issues I see and frustrations. But anyways, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And as always, until next time.